This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by lynda.com, the unparalleled online video training library. For a free 10-day unlimited trial, visit lynda.com slash macvoices. And by Mac Voices Magazine, our free Flipboard magazine that brings you some of the best Mac, iPhone, and iPad productivity tips on the web. High in signal, low in noise, just like Mac Voices, Mac Voices Magazine includes information on how you can get more out of your Apple technology. Subscribe at macvoices.com slash magazine or search for Mac Voices Magazine on Flipboard. Welcome to Mac Notables on Mac Voices. This is a talk of the Mac community. I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, this show is going to do a little bit of a double duty. Uh, we're going to talk about our guest's book or a, a new edition of a, of a book of his, as well as talk a little bit about the Mac Notables 10th anniversary. And the individual I'm talking about, of course, is Mr. Jason Snell. Jason, Hello. good to have you back. It's nice to be back. Thanks, Chuck. Yeah. So let's let's do the Mac Notables thing first, and then we'll get into uh, into the book. But first, I I want to definitely say thank you for all your appearances on Mac Notables over over the ten year stretch. Uh, it's been a blast. I'm happy to. I I wish I'd been on more. I, I a lot of times I ended up not being able to make it. So um, you know, I'm I'm here there. I'm around. Hey, you, you've all, I was happy to be there when I could. Well, that, that was always kind of the concept behind Mac Notables. It was not supposed to be that everybody reported in every so sure. often. It was when you could make it. Um, and and I, I wonder if you can answer a Mac Notables trivia question. Probably not, but I'll try. Do you know the only episode of Mac Notables that I didn't host? That you no. hosted? <laughs> No. Was it like at Macworld Expo or something? No. No? No. It, I don't know. It was on one of the uh, of, of the Mac cruises. Oh, it was a cruise. Okay. It all was right. A, it was a cruise. You, I, I wasn't there, but you all decided to do a Mac Notables and, and, and phone it that in, sounds, so to speak. So. That sounds vaguely familiar. There was a lot of weird experimentation that went on on those cruises. And one of my first, I think the first podcast I ever hosted, believe it or not, was on a, one of those Mac Mania cruises. I was looking it up. It was like Macworld podcast number 18 or something like that. It was a really low number, surprisingly low number. And it was me, but there were a couple episodes that it was, it was just me on the boat talking to, I like talked to Leo Laporte for one. And, uh, you know, that was, yeah, that's funny. Weird, weird things happen when you're at sea, like let's make a podcast. <laughs> Jason, that's, that's an interesting comment that, you know, a lot of experimentation happened. A lot of, a lot of it did in those days. Podcasting was just, you know, coming into its own. And of course, you have jumped in with both feet and a couple fists and a head mm -hmm. and everything else. Now, um, we were talking pre-show about the number of podcasts you produce. Do you? Is it? It's it, only four a week, Chuck. I know more. Well, I know many people who have produce more podcasts than that every week. Uh, thankfully, because I'm really glad I know Mike Hurley because he knows he makes way more podcasts than yeah. I do every week. <laughs> so, does this mean that it's a it's become a mature or a fully formed medium? Or is it is is that just an indication that we have even more experimentation than ever? I don't I don't think it's fully formed yet at all. I mean, I think that it's got a momentum that it didn't before, and you're seeing a lot of big players in there, and that's going to be interesting because a lot of the people who've been doing this for a while, um, you could argue, like in the early days of the web, the reason that they were successful with what they were doing was because there were no alternatives, and now there are a lot of alternatives. So I think definitely you're going to see uh, people feeling a squeeze where podcasts that might have been kind of nice to listen to when there were no other alternatives now have five other podcasts that are just like them that might be better than them. Um, and some of them will, you know, I, I think some of them will feel a, a squeeze, but ideally the, the, the number of listeners to podcasts is growing so rapidly that it outpaces that so that, you know, I, I ideally, if you've got a 20,000 person, you know, 20,000, 25,000 listener podcast, like I do with the incomparable and, uh, you know, and then there are a, a billion other podcasts similarly themed that come out. It, it might mean that my, my number doesn't go down, but maybe it goes up slowly instead of going up faster. Um, maybe it does go down, maybe it goes way up, but I, you know, I, I think it's early days. I think there are, um, anytime you get big companies and, uh, and big names, uh, celebrities and brand names involved, they're going to be. 
I'm not sure they're really primed for experimentation. So, so you're going to see some things that are that are less experimental. But I think overall, the 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 format is so new that there are always going to be, you know, well, always there, there, there's still plenty of room for experimentation. In fact, a lot of the podcasts you hear about, the buzzworthy podcasts, are not yet another podcast where two comedians have a conversation. It's podcasts where it's like nothing you've ever heard before. Like people are talking about all of these fiction podcasts now that are sort of in the mode of serial and they're kind of like, um, serial or they're kind of, they're kind of like other, other things like that, like NPR shows, but they're, they've got some unique flavor to them and, uh, that gets them noticed. And the next thing won't be one of those. The next big thing will be something that feels totally different again. So I feel like it's early days. And when I look at the stuff that I'm doing, yeah, I am doing, um, I'm doing a couple of podcasts that I would say are kind of standard issue. Um, and then I, I do some podcasts that are not at all standard issue and are totally experimental. And um, I feel like there's room for both in the podcast, uh, whether it's a medium or just a format or a subset of the, we can argue about whether it's a medium or not, but I, I, I feel like there's plenty of room for experimentation. I like the approach that you took to it. I've always kind of, kind of defined podcasting as my opportunity to immerse myself in topic X or subject Y or, or whatever. Yes, I, I can become a fan of some podcast hosts where I'm going to at least try anything that, that they put out. But the idea, and that's, that's kind of where Mac Notables and Mac Voices started, that it, it, it was a passion podcast. It was a focused podcast. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you're, if you're in a band right now and you don't have a podcast, I think you're making a huge mistake because you have fans. And even though you might not think it, you know, they're interested in everything that you're doing. And I think there's, there's a lot of truth to that. I, you know, that can be fraught with some danger too, but it, it's a chance just to, I guess, not just release one or two things every few months or every few years, but to really establish that relationship with your audience. Yeah. And for some, um, some areas, I mean, po there, there are a lot of areas where podcasting is really great. Um, comedians have certainly found that for comedy, it's fantastic because you get a funny person who might, you know, come to your town once a year and release a comedy album who buys that does an hbo special if they're really lucky and that's about all they've got and now first off you know podcasting as a medium is really great for them because they're smart funny people who think well on their feet usually and that's a great medium for them and uh so you end up having comedians build up huge followings based on podcasting bands is another good example and we see it i mean even in the tech sphere you you see people who become kind of bigger stars or stars because of their other podcasts so um yeah, it's it's good. It's another it's another piece of the puzzle. And like the web, it it, it lets voices get out there um, that are uh, that otherwise you might not hear from. And literally with podcasts, you're hearing their voices. And it's more technical than the web. But if you remember in the early days of the web, it was really hard to have a website, right? You needed to really be technical. And you know, podcasting is more technical than publishing on the web. But publishing on the web is a lot less technical than it used to be. And po podcasting will get easier too, I think. Yeah, we see more and more services come up that promise to make it easier. Yes, yeah, they're promising. <laughs> yes, some some help. You know, some mm. kind of go sideways, and it's yeah. like, okay, this is not easier. It's just different. Yeah, but, and and fundamentally, it just like TV. I mean, YouTube videos. You know, even like YouTubers, the people that my my uh, my kids love, uh, they have technical knowledge. I mean, there are bad YouTube videos, but like the good YouTubers that I see. You know, they they bought lights and microphones and good cameras, and they 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 even if it was they're self taught, they learned how to do that. And and audio is not as hard as video, but it is way harder than writing a web page because of the technical aspect of it. And so, you know, it's always going to be a bigger challenge. You can start out with a podcast with no technology, you know, other than your laptop, but eventually. Um, eventually, you're going to find yourself falling in the bottomless pit of I'm going to buy a boom arm. And I'm, what microphone am I going to put on it? And do I need a windscreen and a shock mount and all of those things? You know, we all end up there. And that, that, that's a barrier that's going to be a challenge to uh, that, some of the best podcasts exist. The reason that, that, that uh, Dan Benjamin did so well with 5x5 Five Five in the beginning was he brought the technical knowledge to bear. And, his ho and then he found good uh, people to talk to. And I think that model is actually still pretty reasonable uh, because... Now what you're seeing is maybe some podcast startups that are doing this, podcast companies where they'll supply the technical know-how and they will recruit talent. Um, but it's still that you still got to understand audio stuff to make it work. And, and some people, some people can pick that up. 
um, other people who are incredibly talented and we make great podcasters are never going to set up a microphone and push the buttons themselves. So somebody has to facilitate that. And one of the podcasts I do is like that. One of the podcasts I do is with um, Tim Goodman, who's the chief TV critic at The Hollywood Reporter. And he's had a podcast for years. He had one when he was at the San Francisco Chronicle, but the people at the Chronicle produced it for him. And, you know, he is an incredibly smart guy, but he's not a super technical guy. And so his voice was going to go unheard unless somebody said, I'll take care of all the computer things. You just have to talk. And I, I decided I wanted to be that guy because I wanted his voice out there. And uh, there's still room for stuff like that because there are some great people who deserve to be heard um, who are not going to be able to do it themselves. So it's an exciting time, I, I would say, with lots of uh, room to grow. I, I so bad want to go down this this hole, and we've gone down it a couple times, but every we time we do it, it it's here we an, are again. Yeah, it, it's the well, same old hole. It, no, I don't. I don't think so. I, th I think it evolves. It changes, and there's so many different yes. angles. Yeah, there's a new hole, new angles in this hole. Now. Yeah. <laughs> the, the one one point though, I. I I think you're right. I think that there is that it is a whole, you know, the boom arm, the mics, the lights, the cameras, oh, you know, boy. Um, and editing, you could go down that. You oh. could, I, that's right. I've taught a couple of classes in podcasting. And that's one of the things I say is you could literally go down this forever. And you need to and you need to remember that famous saying that I'm not even sure um, somebody actually said or who said it, but it's no, no great art is finished, only abandoned. It actually is really important to keep in mind for, you know, any of these kind of uh fields like tv or, or 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 audio where you could buy more equipment you could there's always a better microphone there's always a better set of lights there's always a better camera there's always more editing you could do it, it just goes on forever and um you have to learn to stop yeah so if you have a case of tech lust folks podcasting is the last place you want to get into because it just it helps you justify more Super and more dangerous. and more you, yep. do you realize chuck how many microphones are within five feet of me right now <laughs> Uh, I've, it's a lot. Yeah, I'll say that. I, yeah. We'll count after the show, Jason. I'll, I'll see if I can match you. Yeah, it's at least, uh, I would say there are at least six podcast related microphones near me right now. Mm. And that's like, I'm one guy. I don't need six microphones most of the time, but I've got six microphones here yeah. and little tripods and little stands and a little and a little recorder and i mean i use that for when i'm traveling and i do remote podcasts but still you know then you have that moment where you're like oh this microphone's supposed to be good maybe i'll just buy it no no don't do it don't oh i bought it uh. <laughs> yeah 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 i have i well never mind we're, gonna, we're yep. gonna leave it there we're gonna leave it there so thank you for 10 years um and here's to another 10 well, thank you we, we're going to try to bring the team back together a little together a little bit and do some of those those just ad hoc things that we used to do that were so much fun. Awesome. Um, somehow we got very serious, and I don't know what happened. So we'll, we'll try to fix that. Today's edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by lynda.com, the unparalleled online training library. Get a full free 10-day trial at lynda.com slash macvoices. There are lots of great things about lynda.com. Things like their constant addition to their amazing collection of video tutorials, with a total of just under 4,000 titles. Of course, it will probably be more than 4,000 by the time you hear this. Things like their series that bring you shorter form, new tips on a regular basis on topics such as design and video gear. Things like their articles, because lynda.com doesn't just do video. Things like their iOS app that lets you download courses for offline viewing. It's amazing just how much learning you can do while the guy in the center seat is wasting his time watching TV reruns on the plane's video system. Things like the fact that you have access to a broad spectrum of topics, from business to photography, software development to education. Things like the fact that you get the kind of training that gets you up to speed on a new topic, or in-depth training that gives you expert-level expertise. Things like the roster of amazing instructors who aren't just lynda.com authors, but who work in the fields they teach in. So they aren't just reading from a manual, but they have lived the topic. Things like the fact that you can try lynda.com free for a full 10 days by visiting lynda.com slash macvoices. That 10 days includes everything, not just the articles and not just the series. Every single video course is at your beck and call for 240 hours by visiting lynda.com slash macvoices. You can watch as much as you want to in those first 10 days and then sign up to keep learning. 
it's going to be a long, long time before you run out of things to watch. One more time, lynda.com slash macvoices for your free 10-day trial. Use that URL to let lynda.com know that you appreciate their support of Mac Voices, just like I do. Thanks to lynda.com for supporting this week's edition of Mac Voices. The other thing that we're really here to focus on and talk about is the latest edition of your Take Control book, uh, Photos for Mac, a Take Control Crash Course. This is the second edition, I believe, of this. Yeah, I think we're saying it's like version 1.2 or something like that. Um, it, it, so Photos 1.1 was released with El Capitan, and it has some new features, and so we felt like an update was, was, uh, was necessary. And one of the nice things about the Take Control series is we do these updates – and um, and you get them. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, a, that's about it. So if you bought the book, uh, you can check for an update and you'll get a new version for the new version of Photos, uh, which is awesome. And if you haven't bought the book yet uh, and are thinking of making the move to Photos, um, the book will be up to date. You won't, you won't get a, a version that is for um, Yosemite. You'll get the version... I think the version for Yosemite is available if you're still running Yosemite. But if you're using El Capitan, you'll, you can get the version for El Capitan. And it's this, you know, I retook a bunch of screenshots and we made a bunch of changes. And, you know, I wouldn't say it's wholesale changes because there are only a few new features in 1.1. It's not. Photos, photos came out midstream. It came out six months after Yosemite came out. And so it's not a 2.0. Um, next year, maybe there'll be a 2.0. But it's a, it's, it is still, they addressed... They did a good job. They addressed a lot of the biggest complaints I heard from people because when you write a book about a subject, it turns out since nobody at Apple is visible to talk to about that, they just talk to people who have written about it. So I got all these people who are angry at me about photos. I'm like, guys, I didn't write it. I didn't make it. I just wrote a book about it. And they're like, why doesn't it do this? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know why it doesn't do that. Um, but I can tell you this, they, the Apple people were listening because um, some of the biggest requests that I heard are in Photos 1.1. I would think that the, take, the, the crash course format in Take Control is probably a little bit easier to update because it's not quite as it's 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 not quite as linear. It it tends to be a bit more quick hits of information along the way as to what you can do or how to do a particular thing. Yeah, it's it's much more visual. There are fewer there are way fewer words in a Take Control crash course book than there are in a regular book. The whole idea is that you're writing, you know, you're writing to screenshots. You're writing with, like, every page has got images on it and callouts and sidebars. And in, in a way, it's a little more magazine-y, but it's very visual. And um, writing that is a challenge. It's, you know, I'm not, I, I would bet you that it's easier to write a chapter of a book with, um paragraphs and paragraphs of text and like two screenshots than it is to write a chapter of a take control crash course because it's dense and specific and you've got to you know you, you end up in situations where you're like i only have five lines of text here to describe this feature because that's what the layout is on this page um but you're right it does lend itself to updates because um every time an update happens you change something in one place and the thread kind of um pulls away and you're like, Oh no, that change actually impacts these five other references I made in the book. And, uh, the take control format, uh, the crash course format, um, reduces that a little bit, uh, which, which was nice in editing it. I was fortunate that my editor spotted a couple of things that I didn't notice were still in there from the, from the previous version. But, uh, yeah, it, all in all, it was fairly easy to, to put the update together once we saw what was in the new version. Do you like the, the, uh, t the, the crash course format better than again something a little more linear because of that. Uh, Cause you just been, said it's tougher to, it's it, a little bit tougher it, to write. It's been ages since I did, um, since I wrote even like some chapters of a, of a standard format book. Um, they, it's different. I would say it's different. I liked, I liked a lot of things about the, the crash course format because it was boiled down and, you know, there's it's something that I learned about about video, but it's true about pictures too, which is sometimes it's very hard to describe how to do something in words on a page and very easy to show somebody how to do it. And when I learned that, I learned that with uh, there was a I've told this story before, but the um, the MacBook when the the white and black MacBook came out, it was the first time in ages that you could swap a hard drive yourself. 
without cracking the thing open. And what you had to do is you had to open the battery bay, take the removable battery out, and then unscrew a couple of things, and then the hard drive just slid out. It was made to do that. It was a really awesome feature. And I was writing an article trying to describe it and how you do it. And I ended up just getting a video camera and like with one hand held the camera and the other hand unscrewed the screws and posted on YouTube and it got like, I don't know what, hundreds of thousands of views. And I had that, that moment of like, this was so much easier to video uh, to show on video than to try and explain with words. And uh, the take control crash course is a little bit like that, where it is the, there are, you get those challenges with writing a book about technology where you end up trying to explain what people can do when it would be much easier to easier to show them. And the crash course, although there's more effort in uh, distilling it down into those little chunks, you've got the image over there that does some of the heavy lifting for you. So I'd say it's just different. Um, and given my background doing magazines and things like that, I was comfortable with that because there's a whole lot of copy fitting because that's part of the deal is, you know, you want all these things to be on the same page with their images and all of that. And so you know, forgive, if, forgive me for the inside baseball. But I think in the end, what you get is something that's like super distilled and boiled down and, and, and packed with information. And it's not overwhelming, but it is like adjust the facts. And there's a picture that shows you what we're talking about kind of format that I, I kind of um, I approve of that. I think it's a nice approach. I don't think most people want to sit and like take a leisurely read through hundreds of pages of text about computers. I, I, I think that's a not super likely scenario for most people. And I think the time of for those kind of books is pretty much past. I think there was a time. So? But you know, now with video and with all the other options, we, we've migrated to a very quick hit kind of, of information kind of society. Yeah, and in some ways, the me the medium is. I mean, <laughs> why were books like that in the past? One of the reasons they were like that is because there was a book production, there was a book industry and a book production sh system, and it was built around putting text on paper and sending it to bookstores. And so, computers are out. Oh, yay! We like computers. Let's do books about computers. How will we do them? And the answer was, you'll do them like every other book by putting text on a page, and we'll ship it to a bookstore. And so, you know, that was not necessarily ever the best medium for this stuff, but it was the one that was there. Um, and the nice thing about, I mean, Take Control has been going on for a long time now, but Adam and Tanya, having done a bunch of uh, books through traditional publishing, I mean, they set out to build Take Control as a digital product from the beginning. And uh, it shows. And the crash course is, is essentially, that format is the culmination of... Um, a decade, I guess, maybe at this point. I, I don't even know how long they've been doing them. A long time of doing those books uh, for Adam and Tanya and for Joe Kissel, who was instrumental in coming up with that format. So a lot of history of even ebook publishing led to uh, the Crash Course format. So it's super clever. I, I really, if people haven't looked, you should check it out. Find a, find a book that uh, is on a subject that interests you and check it out because it's a pretty cool format. And I, I do my best to have all the Take Control authors on any time they write a new book or update a book because I, I really respect the format so much as well as the authors. Uh, I should have put that in the other order, actually, um, because it, 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 it boils things down. It helps you get a handle on a program or, or teaches you something. So speaking of teaching us, what, what are you teaching us about the newest version of Photos? Um, what do you think that Apple did really well? Because obviously you have to know the program in order to write the book. Yeah, the top one would be, um, let's see, I, I'd say the top one is geotagging. Um, one of the things that was missing from the original uh, version of photos was the ability to set locations on photos. So, so if you were taking photos with an iPhone or any other device that does geotagging, it would embed that information, it would be visible, and it used it. It used it to say, oh, you took all these pictures uh, in Seattle in, in August of 2015. And uh, that was nice. But what if you had an SLR camera, you know, that doesn't have or any camera that doesn't do location data or a camera that you that you had maybe uh, back in the past that didn't do that? Well, um, with photos 1.0, you're out of luck. Bottom line. And uh, Photos 1.1, you can do that. You can do it a one by one or you can do it in a batch. And it's all tied into the stuff you'd expect. It's tied into Apple's Maps database infrastructure. So you can type a location and it, it'll search for place names and it'll zoom in on a map and you can move the pin around and drop the pin where you want it to be. And then it's applied to those images and then they show up as being in that location. And then when you search and say, show me Seattle pictures, now those pictures you took in 2003 with your SLR before you had an iPhone 
also say, you know, also show up because they are now tagged as Seattle. So I would say that's the number one feature because a lot of people use location information and set location information and have cameras that don't have location information. And so, uh, yeah, that was, that was by far the biggest thing that I heard from anybody. I realize that this is, we're very early still in the life of, of the Photos app. But it feels like, especially with the addition of editing extensions, that we're moving in the right direction. I don't know that it's going to be a Lightroom competitor anytime soon. I don't know it's going to be an Aperture replacement anytime soon. But am I wrong about that? Do you think it is moving in, in that direction, in the right well, direction? It, you're right. Editing extensions is, so that's the other big feature. That was the other big feature request, is, is apps from the Mac App Store can now run, if they're written this way, they can run as an extension inside the editing interface in photos so you can write an app theoretically photoshop could be in there although it's not but uh, you can write an app and there are some nice little effects plugins essentially that run inside uh, photos because you can't edit externally in photos you can't like click on a photo and say open this in photoshop and then do a bunch of things and then save it back to photos it doesn't work you have to export it then edit it then move it back in and uh, then it's a separate photo because it's been re-imported uh, so this is a workaround for people who want to write apps that use the extensions interface of, of modern OS 10 to do that. And, uh, yeah, that is an aperture feature of a sort that is sort of back, although it's not the same. I am more skeptical, I guess, than, than, than you, or at least the, the sort of uh, statement that you made. I don't think that photos is ever really going to be a replacement for aperture. There are people who used aperture because they wanted a little bit more than iPhoto gave them or because iPhoto frustrated them because it was too slow. Those people might be okay with photos, but the people who are really using Aperture as a professional tool, they should use Lightroom. I, I, they just they should use Lightroom or something else that I'm not aware of, but I don't think Apple, I don't think Apple ever really intended photos to be a replacement for Aperture. I think Apple just sort of said that to soften the blow of killing Aperture. And, um, and, they don't even talk it up to now. I mean, really, like the only time they really talked about photos as a replacement for Aperture was the day they killed Aperture as sort of like, look over there, there's something else. And uh, since then, I think I, I don't think their heart's in it. I think photos was always intended to be iPhoto 10. And um, they changed the name because this fits in with the Apple branding, which is you just call it a noun because it's photos. It's a photos app on the iPhone. It's the photos app on on the Mac. Um, and I, I, yeah, I, I can't see them. It seems unlikely to me that they're ever going to prioritize like professional level features in photos. There'll be some work that could be done by professionals in photos, but it will be more like, um, you know, using a classic computer thing, which is using a product for more than it was ever intended to do. But that's what it would be. It's not going to be like there's a whole professional tier. I, this is just my guess. I could be wrong. I just, my gut feeling is that Apple, um, Apple's not focused on that, and Photos as an app isn't focused on it. I, yeah, I didn't mean to sound hopeful or optimistic. Uh, oh, I crushed I, your spirits regardless, <laughs> Chuck. <laughs> no, not not really. I guess it's just I, I, I find it interesting, Jason, that that all of our tools, that the baseline tool has migrated up. Uh, I mean, the, the iPhoto 1.0 way back when would do some interesting things then. Now we look at it and say, oh, my God, there's, this is horrible. There's nothing here. And so I have to wonder that as the bar gets raised, as, as we all become more experienced, and, and that's you and me. I mean, now, how about the kids who are growing up with this stuff? The bar for them is, is huge because they already know so much more than we did about playing with photos. I don't know if you were a photography geek before, you know, digital no. photography, digital photos or not, but I know I wasn't. And so I know how much more I know about it, and that's where I, that's where I've gotten to. The kids are starting with that. Yeah, but I would say it's not, it's not more. It's different. Um, and I'll, I'll give you some. I'll give you an example of this. The some of it is is volume, right? Uh, iPhoto that ended up being con completely unacceptable was built at a time when digital cameras were new, and you didn't have more than a couple hundred digital photos in your library. And then you end up with 10,000 photos or 15,000 photos in your library. And iPhoto, you know, iPhoto was never built for what happens after everybody's got a digital, a, a 10 megapixel digital camera and has had a digital camera for, for 14 years. 
that that wasn't built for that. And and I mean, I've got a twenty four thousand photo library or something like that now of every photo that I've taken digitally for the last fourteen years since my daughter was born. And um, so that's that's a way where it's changed. And it's not necessarily that we've changed. It's just that the the requirements have to be. Um, have to be different because the world is different. But I'll give you an example where iPhoto let you do something like rate, super fiddly stuff like rate a photo one to five stars. And photos, it's gone. All you do, I mean, you can keyword to your heart's delight, but the fundamental rating system is favorite. You, you, you heart a photo or you don't. And that's it. And I would say for, you talk about a younger generation that's very photo savvy and Instagram savvy, that's true, but their priorities are not our priorities, right? The, there was a time when I feel like iPhoto passed through photography hobbyist world and um, where people loved being fiddly and having, uh, I, this one's a three-star photo and this is a four-star photo. And I think we've come out the other side now where there are so many digital photos and um, what most of us really want to do is just say, oh, that's a good one. Hold, keep that one around. Save that one. Uh, you know, I like that one. Heart. And, uh, that's very different. And, you know, my daughter's relationship with photography is her phone and Instagram and that's it. So I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's just different. I would say it's different. I, I wonder sometimes about her, what photos she's going to end up having from this period in her life, because I'm not sure she's really saving her photos other than posting them on Instagram. I think I just got caught in my own trap, Jason, because I, Aha. I well, when, when you say that, you know, you're right. Um, you're absolutely right, because I think I, I got caught, caught in the geek trap where I, I want I want to make now I'm not going to put in the, the effort that some people would, but I would like to click a couple buttons, slide a couple sliders and make that photo look as good as it can without spending hours. I mean, you and I both know people that will spend hours on a photo to, mm -hmm. and it does. It comes out fantastic, but I'm not about to do that. That's why Instagram filters are so popular, right? Is because, no, you don't have any control, but you can get a lot of the way there without having to do any work. And for most people, that's probably all they really care about. I mean, I used to edit video into like super tight video packages of like my vacation. And uh, boy, I stopped doing that like five years after I started. It was like, yeah, it's just, it's too much. And, uh, you know, I think we get that way with a lot of this stuff is you, there, there will always be there for people to embrace the super fiddly aspect of it. Most people are just never going to do that. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Do you, do you think photos is what it should be, what it needs to be for the, the mass audience where you, you can do some of those adjustments. They have the smart adjustments that, you know, you slide one slider and it's manipulating mm -hmm. a lot of things in the background. Do you think that's yeah. a, it's the right approach? Yeah, I think that, I think the editing tool is well. I mean, that's the, that's the nice thing about the editing tools and photos is that they've got uh, the basic adjustments and then the larger adjustments, but they've also got the filters. So if you want to just do an Instagram style thing, you can just click through the filters and go, oh, that one, and you're done, right? So they're trying to, they're trying to have, or you can have an extension where you're going to go in to tonality and get the exact right black and white uh, set of images for this one setting, and it'll be spectacular looking, it'll look like Ansel Adams took that picture, and uh, you get to choose where you want to where you want it to go. So it's a it's a nice combination. So having spent a lot of quality time with photos, what's your approach to to digital photography? I know you just said you have twenty thousand something library and, yeah. and all that. Do you do you spend a lot of time? I mean, I, you had to obviously for the book, but do yes. you spend a lot of time with your with your personal photos? No, uh, I don't. I. I uh, I definitely feel like I'm using the favorites command to say these are the ones like my daughter just had a birthday party and we took like 50 pictures uh, in a photo booth kind of scenario. And out of those, I just went through them and went fave, 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 fave. I found like six. And, uh, you know, that's the one that I emailed to my mom was one of those. And I would look in the favorites view in order to in, in order to just slim it down. And, uh you know, I think I think a lot of it is that, and I crop. You know, I, I'll crop this one and edit it and send that around. And you know, the, the, if I look for a picture for our Christmas card at the end of the year or something, what does that look like? I I, I do some of that, but it, it's not. Um, it's a lot less time spent with it. I, I did that with our uh, vacation, family vacation we took this summer. It was the same thing. As I looked at all the pictures and I, I faved a bunch of them and and uh, 
that was about it. I mean, I made a, I think I made an album and uploaded some to Facebook and uploaded some to Flickr or something like that. But again, you know, I'm not, what I'm not doing is curating a very careful, having a database also kind of makes that easy that I don't need to have curated that database. I can go back later and say, show me the pictures that we took at Gold Beach, Oregon, and it'll show me all 23 pictures we took at Gold Beach, Oregon, even if it's years later. And um, so in some ways, I don't need to do as much of that curation. It's the same way. I don't put files and folders inside other folders, inside other folders on my Mac hard drive anymore like I used to. I don't have mailboxes nested within mailbox folders, nested within folders like I used to in Eudora. I just have big lumps of archive for files, for emails, because search is so good. And I feel like that way with my photos, too. It's like the photo data is great. I can save all my photos. I'm not deleting photos in order to save space or something. And uh, I can get to them whenever I want. So I don't need to put in a lot of work categorizing them. So I don't. Great example between photos and mail. I think we, any of us that adopted email way back then for business or personal, were a bit compulsive about you know where to mm -hmm. find things because I want to make sure that I know how to find it. Well, because you had and you had to because search was really bad in email back then. Like Gmail now, you can find any message that you've ever gotten in seconds. And even in something like Apple Mail where you've got the spotlight index, you can do the same. And, and back then, you could not do that. It took a long time to find a message if it was lost in a Eudora mailbox somewhere. And, and I, I'm going to defend us a little bit for doing it, just just because we 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 went to that metaphor from the filing cabinet, and the filing cabinet, you know, that was a logical way to sure. organize things so you could find them again. And I think you're right; the search tools weren't there. I mean, search was search was primitive back in no, at that time I, point. I stopped filing messages once search got good enough that I didn't need to file them anymore. And similarly, when Spotlight came out, um, not too long after that, I stopped filing folders you know, files inside folders, inside folders, and ended up with just sort of like, uh, this is where I put, you know, the documents folder. Oh, I put all my documents in there. Or maybe I've got like one, honestly, like right now, if I write something or whatever, it's just in Dropbox. And at the end of the year, I find all the loose files that are in Dropbox and drag them into a folder that's named after the year just to get them out of the way. But I don't categorize them beyond that because they're all searchable. And so I, I can find them later. I don't need a, a, an organizing principle there. And uh, that's just search makes a lot of this uh, much easier. And that's one of the things that's actually really good in photos is search. Like you can type in the name of a location or, uh, or a month. Um, it, it can be a location like a place name like Yosemite National Park or it can be California. Um, and it will find all the photos from that uh, and show them to you fast, which is that's pretty great. Jason, before we leave this, and I'm not sure if this crosses – if this works into the theme of the book or not, but you said something else interesting that I wanted to pursue, and that is your daughter and, and how she's relating to photos and what photos she will end up from, with in, from this period in her life. And I know I've talked about this on the show before, but, you know, when we, when we cleaned out my dad's house, I mean, I, f I found boxes and boxes and boxes of photos, and I ended up having to scan them because they were all, you know, they were going bad. But... And, and, and how I handle that is a whole other discussion. But I've got a huge box of slides from my mother-in-law within about six feet of me right now that we're going to have to scan at some point. Yep, and do it because you will regret it if they start to fade. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, how do you? How does photos help us organize things? Like we talked about the faves and not, but how do we organize and maybe archive them for future use? Is everything in the cloud? Is that is that the answer? Well, it doesn't have to be. You can have it on your on your drive too. I, it's nice to have iCloud Photo Library um, if you pay for the storage, because then you can um, then you can fairly simply just say you're on your iPhone somewhere and you haven't downloaded all your photos, but they're all on the cloud, and you can do a search for that same thing. You can still search for Gold Beach, Oregon, and pull them up, and then tap on one, and it loads the full quality one right there, and you're looking at it. It's pretty great, um, but I recommend that people have a backup on a hard drive too. Uh, Who's to say about digital stuff, about how it's going to go? Um, I think we put a lot of faith into the fact that there's going to be digital continuity and that I think it's true that we'll all have bigger problems if there isn't digital continuity, by which I mean, you know, one day the servers all crash and they never come back. What happens then to our data? I, I think at that point it may be the end of the world or the end of this phase of human civilization. And like I said, we'll be more concerned about feeding each other than uh than about or eating each other one of those 
uh, than it will be about uh, <laughs> a whole about, new sorry, podcast. Jeff, whole, I finally got you. Yeah, a whole um, new podcast. Yeah, well, the podcasts then are going to be t- stories told around a campfire again. That's <laughs> that's where they started, and they'll go back there. If, if something like that happened, that was catastrophic. The problem would be that in a hundred years, or fifty years, or two hundred years, whatever the uh, the distance is. Um, People would be like, oh, I really wish we knew about the, what they did back in the 21st century. And the answer will be, well, it was all on computers and it all got wiped and we will never know. And that, you know, as opposed to uh, in a, you know, having illuminated manuscripts copied by monks in the Dark Ages in order to uh, extend some parts of uh, human uh, knowledge forward. Sorry to think about the big picture here, but so ultimately what I'm saying is, is any data secure, Chuck? Yeah. Um, I think keeping it a, keeping a local copy and keeping it in the cloud is a pretty good uh, one-two punch. And I, I hope that you know the technology that my kids have in you know when they're adults that I will be able to be you know bequeath to them essentially uh, a copy of my photo library that they'll have access to. And um, the dream is that the cloud will give us infinite storage at infinite bandwidth. That it's approaching both rapidly, and that at some point you know, storage is not going to be that big of a pain and it's not going to be expensive and transferring things will be easy. And if that's true, and that, again, that may be the jetpack silver jumpsuit kind of world of tomorrow that's not entirely real, but it could be, then uh, that'll be great because then, you know, they'll have their photos, I'll have my photos of them, and then, you know, they will take whatever part of my photo library they want and integrate it into into their own with their own families and, and it'll just kind of cascade forward and they'll all be like 10 megapixels with 2d. This is primitive stuff, but, uh, you know, that's the way of the world. Yeah. At some point we're going to have to talk about how we archive video, but that's a whole nother discussion. Yeah. That's the same thing. I mean, super, super eight film to, uh, to, I've got like DV cam tapes that are totally like, forget ever reading those ever again. But you know, that's, that's, it's all part of the same conversation, which is digital data and where it goes. And, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a, it's an issue. It's an issue. So the, the photos for Mac, I take control crash course. I got to try to get the title right. Nailed it. Um, how, how much, I know we talked about the upgrade path for folks that already have it, but for the folks that don't, and maybe would like to benefit from your wisdom and all, um, they go to takecontrolbooks.com. How much is this book? I think it's $10. I think all the crash course books are, are $10. Okay. Um, and, or, or yeah, $10. Okay. So any, a bargain, cheap, no. $10. Any, any words of wisdom on how to approach the book? Do you, should they try to go from front to back, or should they just dive in and... Hit? I think you can totally go from front to back. Um, and if you want to keep it as a reference and use it when you want to. I mean, it is sort of written as you start with uh, uh, coming over from other apps and then you're importing and then you move through, you know, editing and sharing and making books and calendars and things. So there is a logical flow to it about like sort of your life cycle as a photos user. But, you know, it's also meant as a reference to, to say to yourself, I'd say, I'd say it's best used as orientation for somebody who's just coming over to photos and want to know like where everything went and how it works and what the features are and how you access them. I think that's probably the best use for it. Great. Jason, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for 10 years of Mac Notables. Um, thanks for the combination show here. It's, it's been a blast. Uh, right quick, what's the easiest way for folks to find everything that you're doing? Because there's a well, lot of it. There is a lot of it. I, I would say uh, you should go to sixcolors.com, which is my website where I write about technology uh, very often. Um, and then there's actually a podcast link there that will tell you what all my podcasts are. So that's a shortcut for that. And, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Jay Snell. Those are the best ways to find me. Great. Good to see you. Great to see you. Thank you for having me. We'll we'll do it again. All right. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Notables on Mac Voices. We will be back again with more Mac Notables, with more great information. We hope you'll join us. Hopefully next time we don't get into cannibalism. (laughs) <laughs> the last episode of Mac Notables. Oh, God, let's hope not. Mac Edibles. <laughs> oh, we're out. Thanks for watching. <laughs>the Mac Voices Dispatch, to stay up to date on all the latest Mac Voices news from our front page or at macvoices.com newsletter. 
Do more with your Apple tech by subscribing to the free Mac Voices magazine on Flipboard by visiting macvoices.com slash magazine. Advertising and sponsorships handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com. That's staying in. I, oh, yeah. I swear. Oh, yeah. How could it not? <laughs> Back edibles. Where did that come from? Holy cow. Yep.